same God in, in Genesis 1 who called to the waters and he gathered the land and he created the world, he is bringing us the comfort of his gospel today through his word. He spoke the creation into, his, his, into existence and he's speaking to us now. The same God who spoke to Israel and gathered them on Sinai, he's speaking to us now, gathering us for worship today. And so hear the call to worship knowing that this is the God who is speaking to you, calling to come and, uh, and speak back to him and tell, you your, tell him your needs and your, your pain and your sorrow uh, to, to be comforted by it. So hear this call to worship. I'll read the part of leader, and you can respond with the part of all. We will exalt you, O Lord, for you have lifted us out of the depths. O Lord, you brought us up from the grave. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his praise, his holy name. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O Lord, when you hid your face, I was dismayed. our sackcloth and clothed us with joy, that our hearts may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, our God, we will give thanks forever. Bow your heads and pray with me. Lord and Heavenly Father, we will give thanks forever. We come today to praise you and to seek your continued help in our troubled lives. Only you are mighty to save. Only you care for your people in justice love, peace, and righteousness. You have not left us helpless, but have given us your spirit. And you not only saved us, but you're, you're using us to save our brothers and sisters too. You are the majesty on high, and yet you came down to earth. You took your nature upon your, our nature upon yourself and carried our burden. With the 24 elders in Revelation 4, we cast down our crowns, our foolish pride, and say, worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power you created all things, and by your will they exist, and we're created. Let us praise him with song. Would you all rise to your feet? Thank you so much, Kyle. Let's sing these words of worship together to our Lord. Sing with me. Who am I that the would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. Chosen 
His treasure, how great the pain of searing much. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. shoulders ashamed to hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished. in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast in Jesus Christ his death and resurrection why should why should I gain from his reward I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain, why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my
sing how deep. How deep the Father's love for us. Amen. You may I take your seats? Yeah. Um, why should we gain from his reward? Is a, a question that uh, should be on all our, our hearts this week. The, the last few days and weeks have been especially hard with grief and, and pain and suffering in our country and around the world. We've, we see war in Europe and shootings on both coasts, abuse scandals in a major denomination of the church. Um, they're frustrating, they're provoking anger and emotions that are hard to put words to. It's times like these we have to gather as a church and lament together and pray together. Today we're, we're going to do that. We're going to silently pray together uh, as, I think, oh, they're playing a song. Um, we'll be guided by this song and the lyrics, which will be on the screen, An Instrument of Peace by the Porter's Gate. The lyrics will be on the screen. Take time to pray and grieve and lament in whatever way that's good for you, for, for healing, for your mind and heart. Afterward, I will close us in prayer, in a, a prayer of lament for this season. Pray with me. Lord, Father, this week has brought sad and horrible news, and we're tired of a routine of this, uh, tired of the inaction of our leaders and scared that it could happen to us. We're growing numb to the pain, and we just ask for help, Lord. Help us to know what to do when we leave here, when we go back to our homes and our workplaces. We're comforted by your love and grace, but we're impatient for your kingdom. Give us the strength through this service, through your gospel, to model your kingdom through this community as a testament to your gospel. Let your kingdom come today so your will can be done on earth as, as it is in heaven, in heaven where there's no strife or war or poverty. God, end these horrible, horrible things. Even locally, we've We've lost loved ones this week, and we've experienced the curse of sin around us every day. We grieve for the anger 
and greed and lust and hatred in our own hearts. Um, Lord, the pride and self-righteousness that blinds us to the pain and plight of our neighbor. Give us your eyes so we can see the world as it truly is, broken and shattered by sin. We grieve the loss of life in Ukraine and Uvalde. Father, help us not to compare these tragedies. There's so many that we start to, we start to compare them and, and minimize one or because of its proximity or because of its magnitude of the other. God, we are small and we cannot see everything as you do. But you are magnificent and see all the sins of the world and yet you loved us and are saving us. Hear our cry today. Out of the depths we cry to you, O Lord. Hear our voice, let your ears be attentive to the voice of our pleas for mercy. My soul waits for you, O Lord, more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Let your kingdom come. Amen. In this dark season, we have a, a, the gift of hope. Hear this, these words of hope from Psalm 145. The Lord upholds all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving toward all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him and to all who call on him in truth. Amen. So I have uh, some announcements for, for next week, two announcements that pertain to next week, and then Jonathan will have a third. Uh, next week we will have our typical monthly picnic, the Warden Brew sandwiches that you can sign up online if you're new. You can look online. We have, we have sandwiches. We'll have a picnic. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> um, and if you notice where she's sitting, some of the old timers, uh, we will be back. The second announcement is we will be back at Design 39 two minutes down the road at a new time. So that's the building there. We will be back there, Design 39, at 10 a.m. So we're meeting here uh, at 9.45. If you accidentally come here at 9.45, you have 15 minutes to make it two minutes down the road to Design 39, which we'll have the picnic afterward uh, underneath that pavilion. So a little more comfortable than the sunny, uh, than the, the sunny patio out here. So we're, we're kind of excited to get back to, des to Design 39 again, 10 a.m., new time. Jonathan has one other announcement for us. Thank you. And Kyle, you can, you can stay up here uh, because I get the privilege and it's, it's an exciting announcement, but also a sad one for our community because we have three of our seminarians and interns uh, who graduated yesterday morning. And so a lot of them will be shifting and changing. And so I'm going to bring them on stage. We have Kyle Groh and Laura. Come on up. We've got their little boy, Thomas. We've got Conrad and Jen and Miller. I'll go this way. You guys can come up as well. And then we've got Chris and Ishani Calvi. And so, come on up. Man, they have no more Hebrew quizzes, right? No more Greek quizzes. Hallelujah. It's a big deal to get to uh, yesterday and today and the freedom that this brings. But, you know, there's, there's a lot in front of you and there's a lot of excitement. And of course, it's the close of a chapter, but it's the beginning of what God has called you into. Uh, nobody really goes to seminary for seminary's sake. I don't know if you knew that. You go to seminary because you feel called to love the church and to serve the church and to make disciples. And, and these families are committing to that. I mean, this is a family affair. This is not just something that dad wants to do uh, because it's out front uh, and, and it's in his heart. This becomes something that the family has to participate in, a calling to, to be a ministry family and to love people and to open their home and, and to um, do whatever they can with the resources they have to spotlight Jesus. And so we want to just say thank you. First off, thank you for your service to our church. Uh, Kyle has been involved with one John Telfer, you may have remembered him, and Irene, uh, but Kyle and John were the leaders of our youth group, our junior high as we started, and now it's expanded into a junior high and a high school ministry, and they have done a phenomenal job leading that, and we look forward to uh, the next season, but they have set us up well. Uh, Conrad in the middle there with the little guy who's about to have it, I get it, man. Um, 
he's been involved in lots of different ways, primarily with our young adults, and he served with me as we've served this year, getting the young adults back in community together and loving them and challenging them to walk faithfully with Jesus. And so Conrad is so grateful for that. And, and Chris has been involved almost, I don't know, every week, every other week with our music ministry, and he is a utility man. He's done whatever is needed, just with a humble heart to come in and serve. And so we're so grateful for your love and service to us. We've had some, some good memories and some hard memories. And part of that is because, you know, the last three years of seminary have not been the easiest years for anybody. And so we've come into a space where we want to dialogue about what God's doing, what he's doing in your life to, to dream and to think and to use, you know, uh, Trinity as an experiment of church planting. And what are you seeing? What are you learning? And I've gone through things. They've gone through things. Our nation has gone through things. And so it's been a unique learning period. Uh, but we're really grateful for the way in which you've just invested and that you've seen the gospel move. And so we know that we are more fruitful uh, because of your time here. And so we will miss you and we love you. And I want to offer a prayer for you and your families. And we have a small gift. So let's pray together if you join me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your love. And thank you for the way in which you sustain. And we know that your sustaining hand has been what is needed throughout a long, grueling period of theological education. And we do thank you that that chapter has come to an end, but we know it's literally just the beginning. We pray the tip of the iceberg in using what they have learned in their mind, heart, character, will, family, all of those difficult things and all of the joyous things that you would use it for your glory and their good as they look forward to uh, where they're headed. So Jesus, we pray for a dynamic season of fruit upon their life and their marriage and their ministry. We know that they are imagining things happening. And so we just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bless them and keep them, make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. And Lord, we pray for uh, the future, the next days, though it's certainly marked with excitement, there's also grief. But we're grateful for the fruit that has been planted. We pray for more as they transition. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's congratulate them and thank you. Thank you. You guys are good. Since you're here, can I have you? Can I have you tell us what's next? Mm -hmm. Where you guys are headed? All right. Yeah. So we are going up to San Jose on Wednesday to do RUF Reform University Fellowship to the campus of San Jose State University. And so I will go and be an evangelist to that campus to, to reach and equip students for Christ and the church. We are also going to work for RUF, uh, campus ministry in Dallas, Texas, at a school called SMU, SMU in Dallas. And we just moved from Escondido to Rancho Bernardo. We're planning to be here, continue serving with Trinity for the next little bit as I uh, pursue licensure here in the Presbyterian. I'm interviewing for a couple associate and assistant pastor roles around the country. <laughs> Guys, you did it. Well done to the little ones. Let's congratulate them one more time. Thank you, guys. Um, as they step off, um, the students, we're going to go ahead and dismiss you. So K through second, you can stand and head towards the back. You'll see your sign and your teachers. And then third through fifth, you can go as well. And then junior high and high school, you can follow Kyle as you celebrate him and send him off today. Go ahead and stand up and greet somebody around you. Thanks so much.
Good morning, Trinity. Greetings to you all once again, church. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. Hear now God's word. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him, the Lord, with all joy. And honor such men, for he nearly died for the Lord of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. His word is good. Amen. Thank you. Well, yes, it's an emotional Sunday for us as a family. Um, I just wanted to say how much it has been a pleasure to serve this church and to be a part of this community. Uh, for my wife and my son and I, this is the church that he was baptized in. Uh, this will always hold a very special place in our hearts. So thank you for all the hospitality and love that you guys have shown us uh, over the years. Let me pray as, uh, as we begin Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your church. We thank you that you have given us community of faith. Uh, Lord, we pray today that you would speak to us by your spirit through your word, uh, that it would change our hearts, that it would reorient our minds, that it would affect our lives, Lord, that you would make us people like Christ. And may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, we pray, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, who are you following how many followers do you have? These questions have become increasingly popular in our culture and also increasingly polarizing, haven't they? Whether it's social media or news media or entertainers and celebrities, whether it's writers or authors, we live in a time where people are uniquely defined and uniquely divided based upon whose voice they listen to, whose opinion they care about, who they follow. What about you? Who do you really follow? As Christians, we know that the answer ought to be Jesus, right? It's kind of an easy one. It's a Sunday school answer. You know, Jesus is the answer. What's the question? But Christians, at the most basic level, we know are supposed to be disciples. And the word simply means followers or students. Or as Jonathan likes to say, apprentices under Jesus. But are we really following him? And if we are, what should our discipleship look like? That's our simple question this morning. Am I following Jesus? And how can I know I'm doing it right? Well, we are in a series through the book of Philippians, and we've entitled this series Practicing Freedom. And you've probably noticed so far, Philippians is a book that is full of these wonderful, memorable phrases, right? You know, things like, He who began a good work in you will carry it to completion on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. To live is Christ, to die, gain. And of course, every CrossFitter's favorite verse, 
I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And over the last few weeks, we've looked at this glorious Christ hymn in Philippians 2 and the beautiful image of shining like stars as we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And then we come to our passage today at the end of Philippians 2, and it might feel like kind of a dud in comparison. I mean, I'm not a betting man, but I would guess that no one in the room, you know, is drawing their life verse from Philippians 2, 19 to 30. In fact, your eyes maybe glazed over a bit when it was being read. You thought, ah, I mean, some logistical details about travel itineraries, some guy with a really long and strange name, a few people are going, a few people are coming. It can be tough to make heads or tails of it. So the natural question that arises, and the one I want to begin with today, is why is this in the Bible? Like, why take the time to read and study this particular passage? Why is it included in the sacred body of text we call the Word of God? I think that's a fair question. And to answer, I just want to make a few observations at first. Um, To start, it's a letter. This passage reminds us that Philippians is, at its core, a real human letter. If you've ever struggled with issues uh, surrounding the integrity or authenticity of the Bible, passages like this one are some of the most convincing proofs we have that this is a genuine historical text. Paul was a real person. He was ministering and traveling to real places. He was writing to real Christians who lived across the world. He was struggling with the realities of being a pioneer of a revolutionary message in a world that's hostile to and threatened by the gospel. You can look these people and places up. In other words, the fact that this little letter is included in in, in Christian scripture, passed down for 2,000 years to us, itself reminds us that Christianity was born in the mud. That the Bible is a real, authentic, eyewitness, firsthand testimony to a historical and undeniable fact. The fact that Jesus Christ lived, died, and resurrected from the dead. In other words, it wasn't scholars or philosophers or poets who wrote the New Testament, but fishermen and prison inmates who happened to witness the miraculous Messiah. Secondly, I think we need to notice that this passage exists in a context. These aren't just extraneous details without purpose, but they're flowing right out of Paul's previous statements, especially his command in Philippians 1.27, where Paul tells the Philippian church, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. That's Paul's purpose in the letter. Paul writes to the Philippian Christians in order to charge this new church in Greece to live up to the standard of unity and service that ought to be exhibited among followers of Christ. And then he goes on in greater detail to describe what that service looks like. And in that beautiful passage, Philippians 2, 1 through 11, we we get this. It's worth reading again. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort in love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So essentially in Philippians up to this point, this is Paul's logic. He charges the Philippian church to live lives worthy of the Christian standard of self-sacrificial service. The reason, look at Jesus. Just as he gave himself away in self-sacrificial love and service to others, so we too as his disciples must cultivate the same mind among ourselves, the same heartbeat. Why? Because Paul yearns to see the Philippian disciples and us grow into true followers of Christ. And then in our passage, he provides a few human examples of what Christ-like love and service looks like. So that's where we are. 
And finally, a passage like this one communicates a very simple truth that I think many contemporary Christians often forget. The church is a global, universal, unified body. Christianity can never be reduced to one particular church, to one special or holy congregation. It's not our church, our congregation, our church's mission, but it's Christ's church, Christ's body, Christ's mission. Amen? We serve a big God who has a big plan of redemption that's not just for us, but for all the people whom he will call in love and grace, sinners from every nation, tribe, language, and tongue. The gospel is not only ours, but it's for the whole world. And though the end is never one local church, the glorious work of the gospel, spreading out like a refreshing dew across the face of the globe, must begin there, here, with us. There's a saying that I like that um, sums up this tension between the big mission of God and kind of the small everydayness of, of our life as we experience it. It goes like this. Everybody wants a revolution. No one wants to do the dishes. But with Jesus, these are not mutually exclusive. His is an upside-down kingdom in which the revolution comes by ordinary, unheralded, foot-washing service. That's the point of a passage like ours. And then as a bit of a disclaimer, um, the message of this text, and therefore this sermon, it's aimed directly for Christian believers. So if you're, if you're a Christian, this one's for you. If you're not a follower of Jesus or are exploring Christianity today, I want to invite you just to listen, to listen in, to take a peek behind the curtain of what the Bible teaches about Jesus and his way of life. In fact, if you are outside of the church or the Christian faith, this might be an especially useful sermon for you. Though it may not address you directly, it will paint a picture of what the inside of this faith looks like, what the heart of Jesus is like for his people, and how that heartbeat should impact the ones who claim his name. I only ask you to consider it, to ask yourself honestly if the lives of these Christians are consistent with their ideals and whether they are truly good and exemplary. So in lieu of the three kind of traditional, you know, alliterative points, I'm simply going to walk through each of the three characters in this story because it is a story. And remember, it's, like, it's also a letter. It's like a postcard. And in it, Paul provides us with snapshots of the lives of three early Christians. Let's look into who these men were and what they have to teach us as believers today. So we'll go through them in turn. We'll spend the most time at the first and then kind of less time as we go down. But we'll talk about Timothy, Epaphroditus, and of course, Paul. So first, Timothy. So who is Timothy? Well, if you've read the Bible, you may remember him from some others of Paul's letters, right? First and second Timothy. And in them, we learn some interesting things about Timothy. He was raised by two women, his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. And Paul knew them as early converts to the church. And they, in turn, taught Timothy from a young age to trust in Jesus and to understand the scriptures. And so Paul invests in Timothy. He mentors him. He takes him under his wing as a pastor in training. And he encourages this shy, timid young man to be confident in his faith, bold in his proclamation of the gospel, and faithful in his service to the church. Let me pause for a moment of application right out of the gate here. Who is your role model? Who are you looking up to? Whose life do you want yours to look like? If you have to stop and, and, and think a while before you answer that question, the likelihood is you don't actually have one. You don't really have a plan for who you're hoping to become. Beloved, I'll be blunt, you need mentors. The Christian life is simply not something you can go at alone. And this person needs to be someone who knows you, who you can talk to, who you can seek wisdom from. And the flip side of this coin is equally valid. Who are you mentoring? Who are you encouraging, leading, discipling? Again, if their name doesn't come immediately to mind, you're probably not pursuing relationships as intentionally as you could. You see, the Christian life is always a kind of twofold existence. We're both disciples on the one hand and disciplers. On the one hand, we're God's ambassadors, and the Great Commission is to go and make disciples, enrolling students of Christ and teaching them the way of Jesus. And on the other hand, our great calling is as children of God to be consistently following Jesus as his disciples. And that is a path that we must walk together in community with others who are following him too. Trinity, if I may give you a charge as my family and I leave this church, let it be this. Serve one another by sharing your lives together. Let the wise among you serve those who are just starting out. 
May the strong among you serve the weak. My young adults, our teachers and students, and all who feel young and immature as Christians, seek out the wise and the godly people whom God has blessed this church with. Be bold and go up to them and ask them questions and listen. And to the wise and mature among us, it can be hard to think of yourself that way, but if you're one who has gone down a distance of the road in the path of following discipleship in Jesus, don't be slow to turn around and encourage those who come behind you seeking wisdom. They need you and you need them in order to know and follow Jesus. So I urge each of you this week to consider these two questions and how you can find a solution to them. Who do I know that I can follow? Who will disciple me in the ways of Jesus? And who can I disciple? Who might lead me down the winding road of faith in him? But back to our passage, we should note that these two letters that Paul sent to the young, shy minister, they were a decade old by the time we reach our passage in Philippians 2. For 12 years, Timothy has been with Paul as his traveling partner, as his companion, his apprentice. And now Paul tells us in Philippians, Timothy is proven. But notice what Paul says next. What qualifies Timothy as a proven disciple? His selfless character. It's so easy to read past, but it's so important. In both Philippians and 1 and 2 Timothy, Paul never commends Timothy for his preaching gift, his uncanny abilities, his intellect, his talent, none of that, but only for his character and his service. You see how upside down that is? What merits highest praise in Paul's economy, in the economy of the gospel, is selfless love for others. Compare that to our world for a second, to your job, to your experience at school, to your experience in American culture, what is valued? If you're being honest, what do you value in a person you just meet, in a friend, neighbor, coworker? Of course, we value appearance, skill, knowledge, ability, efficiency, achievement. Even in the Christian context, we're not above this, are we? Ask yourself, what do I value in the church, in other believers, in my pastor? Is it appearance? Giftedness, brilliance, grandeur? Why isn't it faithfulness? Friends, we must remember all that stuff, all that vain dreaming and seeking after appearance and achievement, that's not the gospel. It's not the way of Jesus. Jesus' way says, consider others more valuable than yourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. He must increase, I must decrease. Interestingly, the description Paul gives us of Timothy's faithful service in verse 20, it literally reads, he will be truly anxious for you. It's the same word he uses, Paul uses later on to say, do not be anxious about anything. But here it's clearly a good thing. Timothy's love for others is so great that he physically cannot stand to not be there, helping and giving himself away for their encouragement in the gospel. You know, he's not the person who gets, like, bothered and annoyed and stressed out every time someone asks him for help, like I so often am. He's the exact opposite, the one who is anxious and distraught all the time when he's not helping. Don't you want a friend like that? And Paul articulates the uniqueness of Timothy beautifully in verse 21. Look there with me. He says, they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. That, that is a phrase worth, worth circling and writing down and reflecting on this week. True disciples do not seek their own interests, but the interests of Christ. You see, earlier in Philippians 1, Paul lamented, see, some preach Christ from envy and rivalry, proclaiming Christ out of selfish ambition. Even in the earliest days of the church, sin crept in. And here's Paul's basic point. Christianity and ambition, selfish ambition, those are like oil and water. They cannot go together. They're fundamentally incompatible. You can't serve both God and money. There's no having my cake and eating it too. The Christian life is a cruciform life. It's a cross-shaped life. It's a giving away of self for the sake of others. It's a dying to self for the sake of the everlasting kingdom of God. And so, beloved, we have to make a choice. Is the gospel just an addition to my life? just an add-on to an otherwise comfortable and enjoyable existence? Or is it a cosmic, catastrophic, 
paradigm-shifting interruption to the status quo, which alters the entire course of my life? Is the good news of Jesus just a nice thing I can incorporate into my other beliefs and hopes? Or is it the belief that challenges all other beliefs, the hope that transcends every other hope? Some seek their own interests, but not true disciples of Jesus. They seek the interests of Christ and his kingdom. Man, does my sinful heart need to hear it over and over. Before we move on to the other characters in the story, I'd just like to point out another feature of the text that can be so easy to overlook, and that is the geography. Um, This is a little Bible reading tip. Um, Look up the place names. If you get a bunch of place names, you have no idea where they are, try to find a map of the ancient world. It can help so much to just have a sense of where these people, where these places are. Um, it, It can change the whole story. In Philippians, um, for example, it's really important to know Philippi and Rome are not close at all. Philippi is nearly 900 miles away. Uh, Even in today's world, I I Google Maps it. It is a 20-hour drive. Imagine walking from Los Angeles to Portland with a strip of ocean in between. That's about what it is. To get to Philippi, it takes a 350-mile walk from Rome down to the heel of the southern boot of Italy. You know, it makes that kind of like a boot. Um, Then you have to cross the Adriatic Sea on a ferry, another 400 miles of climbing up and down the mountains across the rim of the Aegean to Philippi. In the ancient world, traveling hard and dangerous. The trip would have taken weeks or a month, if not more. And Timothy is willing to do this. Not only is he willing, he's anxious to go. Why? Why? Because he cares, and he shares Paul's deep anxiety for the spiritual health and well-being of these people whom he hardly knows, hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Brothers and sisters, we have to ask ourselves, right, in our world, do we care? Does the church really care about the plight of our brothers and sisters? If so, we need to be willing to send help. We need to be willing to send money and people, even our best people, for the consolation and encouragement of the body of Christ across the globe. Remember, the local church is just one part of the greater whole, the fullness of the body of Christ. I think a good litmus test for the long-term health of a church like Trinity or congregations like it is whether or not we're actively sending out people who are equipped and eager to serve the Lord and his church in all the other places of the world and whether we're willing to receive with hospitality and grace brothers and sisters who come to us from all over. Which brings us to the second character in our little drama, Epaphroditus. Well, who is he, and where did he get that whale of a name? I mean, there are a lot of Timothys, you know, and Pauls running around, but I've never come across an Epaphroditus. Um, Some of you are parents looking for biblical names. I'm just saying, uh, Epaphroditus. Um, It's unique. I was uh, trying to go that route with my own wife uh, a little bit, and I, re- I suggested the name Moses for our son, whom you met uh, screaming earlier. Um, it it didn't, didn't go so well. So maybe, maybe the next time, but I'd love to meet an Epaphroditus someday. Well, anyway, who is Epaphroditus? He is clearly a foreigner, both to Rome and to Christianity. And you see, unlike Timothy, right, whose mother and grandmother raised him in the faith, Epaphroditus' name actually tells us something really important. His parents were pagans. He's named after the Greek goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love and pleasure and procreation. We also learn that he's from Philippi, and he must have become a Christian there. And so Paul is adamant about returning him home to his church. In fact, in in these short lines, if we pay attention, we find a pretty extensive backstory about Epaphroditus. He was the courier of the Philippian church, probably a lay person, which means he, he wasn't a minister or an ordained leader or anything like that. And he was tasked with delivering this collected gift, this bag of money that the church sent to assist Paul uh, while he's in prison. But along the way, on that arduous journey that we were just talking about from Los Angeles to Portland, we discovered that Epaphroditus got sick and he almost died. And he was so significantly delayed in his mission to deliver the promised gift. However, by God's grace, he survived and he made it to Paul and he's been with Paul, comforting him and serving him as a delegate of the Philippian church. And now Paul wants to send Epaphroditus back home with this letter in hand that we know as the book of Philippians. And I just think that is worth pausing at for a moment. How cool is it that God recorded the name of this outsider and used him in the special task of carrying God's precious and powerful word? 
But who is Epaphroditus? And why take the time to study him? Another uh, Bible reading tip, when you're trying to understand a passage, one of the best things that you can do is slow down and notice the obvious things in the text. Obviously, Epaphroditus is a man willing to travel a thousand miles to deliver a letter and some money to a prisoner. He's a Christian. He's a member of a local church willing to literally risk his life to serve. But look at what Paul calls him. In verse 25 alone, we get five different descriptions of who Paul thinks Epaphroditus is. Look at these. My brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, your messenger, my minister. Each of these is profound. First, Paul calls this man who was not born in the faith or descended from a notable Christian lineage, he calls him my brother. He calls a man who's probably not a pastor or an elder, my co-worker, his minister. And he calls the courier, the messenger, his fellow soldier. What can we learn? Again, what does Paul esteem? What does he elevate to the position of highest status? Not giftedness, but service. You see, it's not efficiency or sufficiency or expediency that Paul commends. In fact, in those areas, Epaphroditus performed pretty miserably. He got sick. He was late with the money. He almost failed completely in his mission. And we find a little clue in the text that alerts us to the fact this may have been how the Philippians interpreted Epaphroditus' work. In verse 29, Paul commands the Philippians to receive Epaphroditus in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. Why does he have to tell them that? Well, because in the, in the ancient world, culture was shame and honor. And Paul knows that the Philippians may be embarrassed or disappointed about the results of the courier they sent to the great apostle. But Paul will have none of it. He says, no, this man's my equal, my friend. He's a hero. Because he was so impressive and gifted and unique? No, because he was a servant. Anyone who wants to be first must be last and the servant of all. That's the upside down economy of Christ. And beloved, this is just as true in today's church as it was in Paul's day. If you have failed miserably, if you have screwed it all up, if you have been an embarrassment to your family, to your job, to your church, you are still highly valued in the economy of God because his is an economy of grace. There's no favoritism with Christ. There's no hierarchy of spirituality in the gospel. If we confess our sin and look to Jesus alone for salvation, then we are one people, one body, who serve one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and serve him as members of one universal church. Individual ranking systems of any kind are invalid. We've got to stop measuring our leaders, our churches, and ourselves based solely upon the external, experience, the external appearances of talent, attractiveness, and human distinction. We need to start evaluating ourselves based on Christ's criterion. Is he or she a faithful, self-sacrificial servant? Are you? Am I? That's what he's asking you to be. When your life comes to a close, and it will, soon and very soon, you cannot expect God to say to you, thank you for your immense talent and wonderful achievement. He won't say it. But if you endure in Christ by the Spirit to the end, you will hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, let's get really practical. How? How can I be more self-sacrificial? Well, I think here are three simple suggestions. First, give away your money. In some ways, that's the easiest and the most obvious way to sacrifice, I think at least for us in the West who have means. In other ways, it's really tough. You work hard to earn money. You work to support yourself and your loved ones, and that is a good thing. Yet those in Christ need to realize all we have is his. All we have is grace. And we must learn to give generously to the cause of Christ and to people who are giving themselves away to the work that we are unable to do for his kingdom. Secondly, give away your time. This is simple but can be really hard in practice. Give away some of your skills by committing them selflessly for others. Give away some of your knowledge, your wisdom, your expertise. Give away some of yourself by being vulnerable and sharing with those whom God has placed in your path. 
And lastly, give away your attention. Simply listen to other people, especially those whom you find it difficult to listen to or those whom you may not, or who may not have others to talk to. Give yourself away by putting your needs, your priorities, your schedule on hold and asking another human being thoughtful questions and taking the time to listen carefully and care about the answer. If you begin to give your money, time, and attention away from yourself and toward the things of Christ, I think you will find you're becoming a lot more like him. But Paul's praise of Epaphroditus doesn't actually end here. Instead, he returns back to his great theme, using the illustration of Epaphroditus to reveal the one who he follows, Jesus. Paul says that Epaphroditus drew near to death. Did you know that's the exact same phrase he used earlier to refer to Jesus' death? Why is Paul comparing this lowly letter carrier to our Lord and King? Because our King is the servant who gives up his life for the sake of the people. And our Lord is the one who calls us to do the same, to take up the cross and follow him. Here's the lesson for us. According to Jesus, the way up is the way down. The way to gain our life is to lose it. The best life is not the smoothest ride. And friends, we have to say it. We are so content to be comfortable in this life, aren't we? But the calling of Christ is not to a life of comfort, but to a life of risk, to a life of discomfort for the sake of others in the gospel. And there is a lot of risk in following Jesus. We risk our reputation our wealth and our success, leaving our homes and our families and our cultures. We risk relationships with family and friends, with neighbors and coworkers. Some of you know this all too well. We risk ridicule and rejection and persecution and punishment. We risk loss and heartbreak and a thousand disappointments. But what do we gain? We gain Christ. We gain the spirit of comfort We gain the hope that God might miraculously save one person's soul and somehow use us in that beautiful, mysterious process of salvation. Beloved, we gain the hope of unmatched joy. We gain the gift of knowing that we, like Paul, are being poured out for the sake of something so much bigger than ourselves, for the sake of our Savior, Jesus, and his everlasting kingdom. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus says. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In this life, if you follow Christ, you will lose. But in the end, if you follow him, you will gain grace and forgiveness and hope and an abundance of life beyond what you can imagine. But are you willing to open yourself up to the risk? So thirdly and finally, let's take a look uh, at the Apostle Paul. Remember, throughout Philippians, Paul is in prison. He's stuck. He's waiting. He may receive a release any day, and he holds out hope in the Lord for that. In fact, multiple times in our passage, we see Paul trusting in and submitting to the will of God. But Paul knows that he also may be executed, and in a short time, he will be. Can you imagine his situation? The turmoil that would be running through your mind in that interminable holding pattern of waiting? but what is on the forefront of Paul's mind? What's Paul thinking about all day in that cell? Other people. The Philippians, a thousand miles away. His friends and co-laborers in the gospel who are right there with him. The global church, their needs, not his. Their comfort and joy and edification, not his own. And how, how uncomfortable has Paul's life been lately? If you know his story, it's recorded in the book of Acts. He's been shipwrecked. He's been stripped, he's been beaten down, he's imprisoned, and yet here he is, sending away his best help and his greatest comforts. Why? For the sake of the mission, for the sake of the gospel, for the church. And you have to remember, right, like Paul is an apostle. He's a hero of the faith. He saw the resurrected Jesus, and Jesus said to him, I'm choosing you to be a special servant and bring the gospel to the Gentiles. I mean, if ever there was somebody who was a somebody in Christianity, a genius, a skilled communicator, a theologian, a man of extraordinary supernatural gifts, it's Paul. But look how Paul describes his companions. In verse 22, he calls Timothy his son. What affection. 
but he doesn't sun him, does he? He doesn't minimize him or elevate himself above him because in the next phrase he says, he served with me in the gospel. See, for Paul, Timothy is with him, not under him. But the best little phrase in this section comes in verse 20. You can't see it in in the English translation, but that little phrase, I have no one like him. Literally in the Greek it says, I have no one same souled. There's no one else who shares Paul's soul, his mindset, his heart. And whose soul, whose mindset, whose heart is it? It's Jesus's. As Paul commanded the church earlier on, he said, have the same mindset of Jesus Christ, who was a servant. But Paul's effusive praise does not stop with the young pastor, his protege, but it extends even to the formerly fumbling and newly minted friend, Epaphroditus. Paul calls Epaphroditus a layman who maybe almost closely failed in his task that was given to him by the church. Paul calls him a co-worker, a co-laborer, a brother in arms. No difference in title, no difference in status. See, in the workforce of Christ, Paul's desk and Timothy's desk and Epaphroditus' desk would be cubicles side by side. In the ministry service of Christ, Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus are of equal rank, foot soldiers on the front lines, fighting the forces of sin and Satan in the world side by side. Beloved, is that not a remarkable thing? In the economy of Christ, you and Paul are spiritual equals, brothers and sisters, fellow children of the Most High God, fellow disciples, fellow servants. When you find yourself measuring others not by their appearance or accolades, but by their love and service to Christ, you can know you're following the way and sharing the heart of Jesus. So yes, Paul is holding out these other men as examples to the church, but the point of his message is not just be like Timothy, be like Epaphroditus, but be like Christ, who though he came from God and was going back to God, got down on his knees with a towel wrapped around his waist and got up on a hill and died there with a cross borne upon his back. And he did it for you, for the forgiveness of your sins, to give you the gift of righteousness and reconciliation with God. And he did it for his kingdom, for his church. So is it worth it? Is Jesus worth it? Is he worth all the pain and suffering that Paul endured? Is he worth not living the life that you imagined, not achieving all of your personal goals or pursuing every dream, not being comfortable all your days? A pastor friend of mine is fond of saying, every life is an unfinished life. Is Jesus worth leaving a lot, losing a lot, suffering a lot? In other words, is he worth following? Beloved, you are worth it to him. See, Jesus left heaven and bliss to come down to earth and to take on flesh. Jesus lost followers, friends, reputation. He lost blood. He lost his life. And Jesus suffered the sting of death the weight of the sin of the whole world, the wrath of the Father. He drank it down to the dregs. And he did it because he loved you. He humbled himself, taking the form of a servant so that you might be saved and the whole world might be blessed through him. Amen? And friends, if that's true of you, if Christ has come and died and borne our penalty and won the victory of righteousness and eternal life for you, he's calling you to follow him into a risky but beautiful life of self-sacrificial service. I'll end with just a brief story um, from the writer and, uh, and pastor Francis Chan. He says that people like to think of Christian discipleship like, uh, like a man with a thousand dollars. You know, you think I've got a thousand bucks in my spiritual bank account, right? And what Jesus really wants for me to do, he wants me to go to the bank and he wants me to withdraw the thousand dollars. You know, just take, liquidate the account, take it all out in cash, put it in a bag and walk all the way up to the doors of the church, even to the very altar of Jesus and pour all the money out, right? One big act of commitment, of service, of being all in for Christ. But Chan says, it's really not how Christian discipleship works. He says, no, it's more like you do that. You do all those things. You get all that money in the bag and you bring it to Jesus. And Jesus says, thank you. 
but he doesn't take it. Instead, he hands you a bag of quarters, and he says, go and distribute these in the world. And come back when you need more, and I'll be here. Christian discipleship is not just one big commitment. It's not just one big act of service to God. Of course, it does take faith, but discipleship is a costly, daily giving away of the self for the sake of the gospel and the benefit of others. Beloved, Christian discipleship, following Christ, apprenticing under Jesus, is the highest calling of our lives, the one thing that most glorifies God and fills us with joy. But it comes at a cost. And the question each of us must answer is simply this. Is it worth it? Is Christ worth it? Let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are a good God. You are a great God. You are so much bigger than my life, than my story, than one individual church. You are involved in a world reclamation project, and you are including us in grace in it. Thank you, Jesus, that you came not to be served, but to serve, to give your life as a ransom for many. That, Lord, you put a towel around your waist and a cross upon your back to show us how to love, to reconcile us to God, and to lead us into the fullest life God, we are thankful for this church, for the people here that you have called, the ways that you are using them. I pray that you would move in hearts even today, that you would send some, that we would receive many, and that your church would be blessed by our faithful service as we grow more and more into the image of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you all rise to your feet and let us respond in worship. to rise to you when to 
temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you, Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my song, teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. I 
believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. space for our church. It's a gymnasium, isn't it? <laughs> and you've been looking at the banners. Goodbye, banners. We have loved you. Um, but it's been a sacred space for our church because we are a church plant and we are figuring out where to, to live and where to worship. And so we're very grateful to have been here. And so what I'd love to do as we leave today is to ask you to, to shift through the aisle. And if you're willing and you like the person next to you to hold their hand, if you're uncomfortable with that, give them a fist bump or whatever. But bump an elbow, get close to each other as I send you out of this space with what we call the, the benediction, uh, which is a sending out. So can you do that? Move through the aisle a little closer to somebody. I like to mark things and to remember. And it's a special thing within Christian churches and traditions just to say, this has been a good season and we move into the next one. And we're grateful for this space. And not only we sent out sent out together for the last time worshiping here. So receive now this word of benediction. May our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit reveal to you that he has given you purpose in Jesus Christ, that the gospel is good news then and it's good news now, and that we as a church, because of Christ at the center, will move out in the power of our suffering servant, Jesus, who gave his life for us. And so we're grateful to have been here and we go out with hope, with the mercy of God and the grace that is always ready. May the gospel guide you until you come back at 945 next week. All right? Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us.